Have you ever been sitting in front of your computer, perhaps falling asleep in class? Maybe you were driving yourself to your job flipping burgers at your local Arby's. Or perhaps one evening you were sitting at the dinner table as your parents argued over which of their children was the true cause behind their failing marriage, and thought to yourself, how would I fare in a zombie apocalypse? You could be an obese weeaboo who spends the majority of their life in their mother's basement, working their burger flipping job to earn enough money to obtain the perfect amount of Nobara Kugasaki fanfare, saving up the few pennies your mother allows you to keep after paying for your Domino's addiction, to finally purchase that body pillow to milk the remaining serotonin receptors in your brain of those few final molecules. Maybe you're a gigachad fireman with biceps the size of Burmese pythons pectorals juicy and blasted from a workout earlier in the day. Your shirtless and glistening body drips with sweat down your perfect Ao Toto physique as you save the aforementioned weeaboo from his dank, dark cave. After a friction fire started with a body pillow he had acquired in the mail days before. You could even be an average Joe, who at night turns into a filthy criminal, and steals from the god Chad's house while he's out rescuing those who embrace modernity. Your nimble and slender fingers, possessing the dexterity to not only pick the locks of those trusting in you, but also the smarts to hotwire your aunt's car after you've robbed both her food and medicine cabinets. Your sneaky frame allows you to glare through the basement windows of the weeaboo unnoticed, as you plan to steal his limited edition Jujutsu Kaizen Nobara Kugasaki Art FX J figure with bonus face, suspiciously placed on his nightstand. The point is, regardless of who, or what kind of eldritch abomination you are, a sandbox environment has been created to offer you the chance, nay, the opportunity, to test one's abilities in a perfectly simulated zombie-infested world. However, some level of imagination will be required, as even though you will be able to custom build your IRL meat suit avatar in the game, you will be forced to mold this mindset into that of a mid-1990s Kentucky citizen. Welcome to Project Zomboid. God only knows why, but a mishmash group of English and Canadian nerds decided to create a fictional but nearly identical replication of the real-world location near Fort Knox and Louisville. For all those strange non-Americans who have stumbled into this video, well, and also for the geographically challenged that. Americans, that means that this takes place in northern Kentucky. And if for some reason you aren't photo-familiar with this God-blessed country, that would be located here. To get things started, you'll need to pick a game mode. Your options are Apocalypse, Survivor, Builder, or Sandbox. Your best option here is going to ultimately end up being Sandbox, but to get started, just select Survivor. If for some godforsaken reason you decide to dabble in the infinite power that Sandbox grants you early, don't be surprised if you completely fuck your experience in one direction or the other. I highly recommend your first experience be what the devs deem to be the way the game should be played. The sandbox option allows you to change everything from zombie population to loot rarity, including other aspects of your reality, if you so choose to dabble in God's realm. However, once again, I strongly recommend that you go with Survivor. It will give you the most balanced experience possible to anybody starting the game and is even fun at a veteran level status. Now I'm not a betting man, but if you told me that you were planning on choosing Apocalypse for your first time playing, I would bet on your death. And if you're interested in Builder, just go play Minecraft, you little itty bitty iPad baby. Next up, you'll need to pick your spawn location. The game map is absolutely massive. In real numbers, the map is roughly 33 square miles. Or, for our imperially challenged friends, 87 square kilometers. <sighs> but Ruby, you say. Followed by another phlegmy inhale, leaving you somehow even more out of breath than before. 33 square miles isn't that big. To which I say, au contraire, my little mademoiselle, it's big. There are four spawn locations, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. Riverside. It's by a river. River is water. And you need water. Rosewood. This is where the babies start. However, don't go southwest and down the scary forest path. There's a large brick building surrounded by fences where undead criminals prowl, known as a prison. Muldrow is a solid spot right in the middle of the map. It also has everything that you'll need to survive. And if you're enthusiastic about going north and south, you'll have an excellent time here. Finally, while West Point is one of the best places for loot, it also has some of the most zombie spawns, making it very, very hard to survive in. This town contains one of my personal favorite places to set up a base, as it's far away from the common people, 
and allows you to feel safe. In my professional opinion, your best bet is rosewood. While infinite water sounds nice up in Riverside, it's not needed since it falls from the sky. You dummy, that's called rain, and it's free. Plus, there's almost always a toilet nearby with water for you to slurp up. But if you pick West Point for your first venture, you finna die, cuz. Die real good. Now it's time to create your avatar of zombie destruction. The first thing to pick is your occupation. At first glance, all of the options here may seem rather overwhelming, but allow me to alleviate some of your anxiety. None of these really matter. Don't worry, the crushing reality that you have no idea what you want to do with your life will not follow you into the zomboid world. Yes, some occupations like burglar give you the burglar skill, unobtainable by any other occupation, but all it gives you is the starting ability to hotwire cars and break locks less often. Fortunately for you, hotwiring cars is a very easily learned skill. All you'll need to do is take apart a few thousand watches and lamps, bingo bango, you'll be hotwiring cars like you're a street urchin. And in regards to stealthfully getting into windows, it doesn't really matter when you can simply do things the old-fashioned way. All the other occupation-specific skills can either be learned or simply aren't worth it. Once again, in my opinion, the only one that should have an argument made for it is the veteran occupation. This occupation grants you the trait of desensitized, which makes you a stone-cold son of a bitch who won't break down into tears when more than three zombies lumber towards him. What a intelligent man would do is pick the repairman occupation. It starts you with plus two in the maintenance skill. Maintenance, along with nimble, are two of the most useful skills in my opinion, and they do not exactly advertise their usefulness. As for why, I'll get into that later. The next step is to pick your traits. Now, unlike occupations, traits actually do matter and will have a drastic impact on your gameplay and how your lives are going to go. Too long didn't read, just do whatever you want my man. End of day, you're going to die in five minutes from either a zombie bite, or you're going to run over a fence too fast and tear your groin into an unrecognizable mess. Now that you understand that this game is hard and you don't know how to play, let's try something a bit more balanced. You may have noticed when picking your occupation that the points to spend in the bottom right hand corner menacingly changed from green to red. Unlike the real world where some people rolled a nat 20 and others a natural 1 in regards to their genetic lottery, in Zomboid we're all created equal, and that value is 8. 8 on its own doesn't seem like a lot. But with the right care and consideration, you can create a powerful, godlike being of a character. The goal here is to take negative traits that can either be dealt with easily or have little impact to your gameplay, and use those gained points to purchase positive traits. For example, High Thirst, Weak Stomach, Sunday Driver, and Slow Reader are all easily dealt with. You'll notice that after you've selected these four negative perks, that you'll have an additional 12 points to buy positive perks. Positive perks like Lucky, Light Eater, and Brave. These three perks by themselves will greatly influence your gameplay. And before you little shits come after me saying, Oh Ruby, Sunday driver is so bad, I can't stand driving for so long. A. You're an impatient little shit. And B. Enjoy your fractured femurs, Mr. Walker. <laughs> I don't... Is that inappropriate? Is it too early? It might... I don't know. I'm, it's fine. You can play around here to find a build that you like, but my only other piece of advice would be to not allow your fitness or strength to get below three. Fitness determines how long you can do things like run or swing a hammer into a putrid zombie's skull. Strength determines how much you can carry, and things like how much damage you do when utilizing the skills you've learned while studying the blade. At the end of it all, it really doesn't matter what you do. As long as the traits you pick allow you to have the playstyle that you enjoy, you'll be having a good time. Now, remember moments ago when I told you, as long as the traits you pick allow you to have the playstyle that you enjoy, you'll be having a good time. Forget that. Fun is for babies. Buckle in, strap on. It's time to join the sweats. For your occupation, take Repairman. As I mentioned earlier, maintenance is important, and being a repair boy gives you an experience boost as well as an initial two points in that skill. But, 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 Ruby, where are you? Negative four points. Next, you're going to want to take the following negative perks. Heavy quotations. Unfit, weak, and obese. Some people will argue that being underweight is a better choice, and those people may be right on paper. Being obese means that you can't eat because you need to lose weight, fatty. And if you're not eating, you're hungry, chubby. And if you're hungry, you're weak, tubby. Being weak means you can't carry as much. Underweight, on the other hand, allows you to eat and therefore carry more when full. 
However, once again, in my own opulent and perfect opinion, the character arc that you're able to achieve from going from a fatty, fat, fatty to a lean, clean, zombie-killing machine appeals to me on a personal and spiritual level. Before we go any further, allow me to rationalize why taking these three rather consequential negative perks works out in the long term. The same way that a teenage boy will rationalize to his doctor why he needs SARMs to achieve peak goblin form. Taking the three negative perks, unfit, obese, and weak, truly sucks. I mean it. It's absolutely horrible. It takes an already very difficult game and makes it essentially unplayable. Project Zomboid boasts itself as the ultimate zombie survival RPG. One of the reasons it's an excellent RPG is it punishes you for taking punishing perks. However, just like in real life, with enough willpower, anything is possible. These three perks, while incredibly debilitating as they would be in real life, can be reversed through hard work and perseverance. Each of these three traits relates directly to a trackable stat. Unfit and fitness, weak and strength, obese and weight, respectively. Unfit and weak can be handled with regular exercising. 30 minutes once a day is the best option. While most people choose to ignore the reality of life, Zomboid forces you to realize that if you simply stick with it, you will see results. By simply doing 30 minutes of burpees each day, you'll begin to see the fruits of your labor drip in. Ultimately, training your fitness and strength fucking sucks. However, I will discuss the specifics as to why in a bit. Lucky for you, there is another option, as long as you find some pain pills. If you exercise in pain, you don't get experience, so pop a volume and do some burpees. Burpees work both your fitness and strength. Since at this point in your playthrough you're just a fucking mess of a person, it's best to work them both. This little regularity bar right here also works as it does in real life. You move more often, you get sore less often, and you recover faster. Or you can just be a chad and eat oxy like candy. I don't know why, honestly though, I do feel obligated to tell you that you really shouldn't do this. Don't take pain pills and exercise. You really shouldn't even be taking ibuprofen, aspirin, or Aleve. You gotta suffer through the pain. That's the whole point. You know what? This is, I'm kind of pat. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Finally, obesity can simply be fought by not eating. Just eat vegetables and low calorie food and you'll be fine. At 100, you'll be just overweight, and at 85, you'll be normal according to these fat-phobic developers. The game becomes much more tolerable when you're overweight, with just three strength and three fitness. Now that we're done rationalizing, let's get back to creating our character. If you pull out your magnifying glass, you'll see that we're now sitting at 26 points. Wow! That's right, little buddy, but we're only just getting started. Now you're going to take... Sunday driver, slow reader, weak stomach, prone to illness, conspicuous, slow healer, high thirst, and thin skinned. Bam! 60 whole gosh dang points to blow at the trade store. Quick little breakdown of why these don't matter. Sunday driver, you don't want to go fast in this game. Slow reader, when you can speed up time, this doesn't really matter. Weak stomach, don't eat raw food and you'll be fine. Fatty. Prone to illness, don't get a cold and you'll also be fine. Slow healer, you get touched by a zombie, you're dead anyway, so who needs to heal? High thirst, water is everywhere, you just need a bottle. Thin skinned, again, you get touched by a zombie, you're dead anyways, so who needs to heal? Now with all these points, you're gonna take the following. Cat's eyes, dexterous, outdoorsman, wakeful, brave, graceful, light eater, lucky, eagle-eyed, fast learner, keen hearing, organized, and handy. In theory, we have created the ideal weeaboo. A man who has honed his mind in his mother's basement while letting his physical prowess fade away. Rather than studying the blade, he spent countless hours looking at a screen playing FPS games, focusing his sight to notice the smallest of movements, training his ears to hear the lightest of footfalls. He harnessed and then weaponized his autism to learn with excelled prowess. By watching countless hours of the TLC show Hoarders, he's optimized his organizational abilities. Many evenings have been spent on YouTube watching restoration videos. He understands not only what's handy, but how to be handy. And through countless viewings of Juji Eno's work and rewatches of Berserk, followed by arguing on forums that the old is better than the new, his spirit burns with an unwavering flame, unaffected by fear. At the very least, we've created what a basement-dwelling weeaboo thinks that he is. Wow, only 15 minutes in and now we finally get to discuss the gameplay. Hit that start button and here we go. Now that you've spawned into the world using our plus ultra weeaboo build, the fun can truly begin. <laughs> I'm kidding. You're gonna have a really bad time. The UI here is simple but complex and not intuitive until you click around a bunch. Maybe I'm just a stupid ape man, but I couldn't figure out that you could close the inventory by clicking anywhere on the screen for hours. Guess I'm just an idiot. First things first, you'll want to loot the house that you spawn in. 
Right now, all you have is your sweat-stained t-shirt and your denim jeans from high school that fit just right when you suck in your gut. So here's what to keep your eyes out for. Food you can pass on. Since you've been accumulating mass for years now, you only really need to worry about it when you're literally starving. At that point, you'll actually start dying, but even then, you'll be fine for some time. First, click on this little weird box. This is your inventory. You'll see it's separated by what you've got equipped and what's actually in your inventory. As you walk around, this little window will populate either with lootable containers or what's just simply on the floor. With your strength so low, you can't carry very much, so you're looking for just the bare essentials. Best thing you can hope for is a trash bag. You can equip it in your hand to increase your carrying load. Bags and containers, when equipped, reduce the weight of things. Makes no sense to my stupid brain, but hey, here we are and that's how the game works. You might get lucky and find a school bag or a satchel in the bedroom of the house, but odds are you'll just find the plastic bag. Be careful and don't get your head stuck in it. Don't worry yourself, we won't be playing downtown major city simulator for too much longer. Next, you'll want to loot the kitchen for something to smack zombies with. My personal go-to is a rolling pin, but anything will do, and I mean that incredibly sincerely. You can literally only push and stomp otherwise. At this point, you're also probably thirsty, so drink from the faucet and get ready to go outside. In your weakened weeaboo state, you're basically good for small 30-minute bouts. That is in game time, not real time. Also, don't run. That will expend precious endurance. Right now, all you want to do is take on a small group, go back inside where it's safe, rest, and take a seat. Quick side note, this game is still being developed. And while it's highly playable with essentially no bugs in my 150 hours plus, there are some quirks. This is one of them. Make sure you rest and then sit for maximum resting gains. My headcanon is that it's a mental thing. This leads me to talk about how your energy works in this game. You have both endurance and sleep needs. Actions like running and hitting drain endurance. Sleep need increases faster the less endurance you have. It's confusing, but all you really need to know is you should rest before you're exhausted to maximize the time you can stay awake. Although there are ways around this. One final note about exhaustion. When this little Moodle shows up, that's your sign to stop and go rest. No matter what, that becomes your next priority. You do less damage and move slower, and if you push it too far, you'll literally be unable to run and you'll die. So rest up a lot. So, for now, all you'll really be doing is killing small groups of zombies, breaking into houses, and eating whatever foods you can like a little gremlin man. I recommend looting the fridges first as they tend to contain perishables and water bottles. You need a water bottle so you can stop sucking on faucets and licking toilets all the time, you weirdo. Why it's important to eat the perishables now rather than the canned goods is because of one of the only real hurdles you will face in this game, the water and power shutoff. Both of these are rather inconsequential and can be dealt with easily, but are scary in concept. However, we'll cover how to deal with these issues in a moment. For the first night or two, you'll survive and clear out a small area, but soon you'll want to establish a base to strip this land of all of its natural resources before you move on to the next town to suck it dry. As you're working your way through the neighborhood, along the way you should hopefully stumble into a zombie with a bag of some sort. The best you can really hope for at this point is a duffel bag. But don't be afraid to sell for that school bag. If you don't find a zombie with a bag, well, it sucks to suck. My best advice is to simply kill more and get lucky. It's really only a matter of time and you'll get there. Promise. Getting a bag drastically changes how much you can play the game. And I mean that literally. It changes how much you can play the game. As you can start to collect loot, which is one of the truest sides of this game. It is your sole purpose to collect, hoard, and organize all of the goodies in the game world. Once you've found a spot to squat for the time being, you can begin to achieve some level of safety by using one of the skills in this game. Just like Jesus, it's time to become a carpenter. What you'll want to do now is grab a hammer, saw, and screwdriver and begin to tear up all of the wood objects in your house. Don't be afraid to visit the neighbors as well. For resources, anything you can take apart is worth your time. With your level being as low as it is, you will fumble as the idiot you are. Thinking that watching all of those hour-long craftsman videos on YouTube have somehow endowed you with the expertise needed to disassemble an Ikea chair. Unfortunately for you, you'll black out and when you wake up, you'll be covered in a cold sweat with the remaining splinters of your jock mock in front of you like a gourd antelope. The short of it is, low level equals no resources and broken things. High level equals more resources and no more broken things. Once you've got some planks on the floor and some nails in your bag, you can board up the windows of your house to keep the vagrants at bay. Four planks per window should do. You can do four on each side, but let's be honest, if you've got zombies coming through four planks, eight isn't going to do you much good either. You'll notice that earlier I said for resources, anything you can take apart is worth. 
but for leveling there is only one acceptable option. Double Beds For some reason, disassembling a Hauga fills your mind with immense skill and experience. To an absurd level, most houses have at least one bed, and if you can find a motel, you're pretty much already at level 10. With these skills that you've acquired, you can build things like doors, gates, and walls. Most importantly, however, and most crucial to your survival, you can now build rain collectors. Not only can you use them to gather water, but you can also plumb them into your house, making your faucets and other water-based appliances no longer useless after the water is shut off. Be sure to boil any tainted water, though, otherwise you'll die of diarrhea, which would just be plain embarrassing in a zombie apocalypse. Another thing you should make sure to do before you do anything granting experience is read the applicable book, Expand Your Mind. By reading the literature of our forefathers, you gain experience boosts, drastically improving your leveling ability. Honestly, don't do anything unless you've read. It's worth that much. You can find books and houses, but most towns have a bookstore you can loot or a school that you can vandalize. There are five per skill, so keep your eyes peeled. In addition to books, you need magazines. As much as I wish I was talking about the porno mags, I'm not. You specifically need to find how to use generators. Previously, I mentioned that the water and power shutoff is relatively easily handled. However, handling the power shutoff is completely contingent on you finding this magazine. Unless you're a nerd who chose to get an electrical engineering degree, even with 10 electrical, you can't connect generators to buildings without reading this magazine. Once you get it and read one, though, you're set. To keep the lights on, all you'll need is two generators, one for your house and another for the gas station. Slap those power babies into place and you've got infinite power. Also, before you ask, gas doesn't go bad and you will never use all of the gas in a single gas station. Once you've got your water and power sorted out, you're set. So long as you don't forget to maintain your generator once a week or so. Otherwise, things can get a little... Explosive. So, you've fortified your house, got some rain barrels for water, and now you've got a generator going. Now what, you may ask? Now, you can actually play the game. While looting, you should accumulate weapons of all kinds. Why? Because they're gonna break all the time. Also, you should stick to a type of weapon. It is in your interest to focus on one type of weapon. And that one type is long blunt. Long blunt is the only real choice, as crowbars exist in this category. Crowbars are the best item to use to level your maintenance. Why is that important? Because due to math, maintenance is what determines how your weapons degrade per use. Here's how it works. Maintenance goes up when weapon condition doesn't go down. Every time you hit something with anything, you roll the dice, or more accurately, you run an equation. Either your weapon condition goes down, or it doesn't, and you'll get maintenance XP. The higher your maintenance level, the more hits per weapon you get. But why crowbars, you think, while scratching your unibrow? Because out of all of the weapons in this game, they have the lowest chance of degrading, at 1 out of 75. It's really not worth using anything else until you get about level 5 maintenance. Once you have level 5, then you should use spears, because everyone knows that the most deadly weapon in the hands of a man is spear. They're also renewable. Since you can forage for sticks and all you need is a knife and a plank to create them, which you should have no shortage of with your level 10 carpentry. It is important to note the unfortunate reality that spears tend to break constantly, but they also have an auto-kill chance and attack fast most of the time. Sometimes, the game chooses to do a stab, which locks you into an animation that technically never happens unless it's just one zombie. 100% of the time you should be fine, but that doesn't make my butthole pucker any less. End of the day, spears are the best for mass killing for the aforementioned reasons, but any of the other weapons are worth at a high enough level. Long blades, however, only have two, a machete and a katana, both of which are very rare and don't really appear until late game. As you kill and clear and loot, you will also find guns. Do not use these. Your aim is shit. Your best bet is to hoard them all until you find a shotgun with around 200 shells. You'll find plenty of shotguns on zombies or in houses. For bulk ammo, you'll need to loot a police station, gun store, or find a safe house where some preppers store their ammo only to die locked in their bathroom. Most towns have some level of gun storage, so this shouldn't be an issue. Go to bed, wake up nice and early, strap up, and run to the main part of town. On your way, be sure to yell a lot, but don't stop to fight. You want to lure them in give them a false sense of security. Once you have a substantial group following you, it's time to start blasting. Sprint ahead of the group, hold your ground, aim, and be sure not to move. Wait for green for go, and blast. Red is bad, don't shoot on red. Your aiming skill will level incredibly fast, and after you've killed a few hundred zombies, you'll be around level 5 aiming. Reloading is of less consequence, so don't worry about it. Pistols are a one-tap situation 80% of the time. Pistols are very fun to use. 
With 10 loaded clips in your backpack, you can hold off quite a few zombies. Unfortunately, there is a finite amount of ammo in the world, so guns are more or less of a stress release or an emergency use option. Bashing, mashing, slashing, and slicing zombies will be your primary way to fight through this world. This brings me to the end game. As with most sandboxes, there is no real way to end the game. It just goes on and on and on and on forever. I've heard rumors that one day there will be some sort of an official end, but this game doesn't need that to be fun. The beauty of this game is it is what you make it. You can spend your time clearing towns of all the zombies, or you could literally just go deep into the woods, hunting and fishing for your food, only seeing the occasional shambler come towards you. The best way to test yourself and your skills you've learned while playing Zomboid would be to head to Louisville. This is one of the most recent additions to the game, and it is the most city city that it has to offer. It has skyscrapers or at the very least what appear to be skyscrapers, and truly makes the other population centers look like little towns. This is one of the most densely populated areas, and even requires some level of expertise to get into as it's surrounded by a military blockade. But, to be completely honest with you, I've spent barely any time there. This game, while fun, really comes down to the following. How long can you play smart, careful, and not get yourself fucked by a corner. Even if you do go slow and steady, you'll probably get fucked like I did in my previous run where my game alt-tabbed and I proceeded to get mauled to death. I am indeed still bitter. <laughs> I'd like to quickly highlight the other skills that I didn't really talk about because I don't find them very exciting, but they should be addressed. Cooking is great for your mood and energy levels. Farming is super self-explanatory and boring, highly useful later in the game once you've looted all the towns for their non-perishables. Like I said though, boring. Dig a hole, throw in a seed, wait, and then eat. First aid, here's what you need to know. Put a band-aid on the cut. Use disinfectant if you can. Deep wounds need sutures. Just don't get hurt and you'll be fine. Electrical. Stupid and imbalanced. Just grind to level 2 by taking apart lamps and watches so you can hotwire cars. Metalworking. Until you're building a final base, not worth dabbling in. Resources are hard to come by and it's very, very grindy. Mechanics. Simply find a new car. Tailoring is one of the most useful skills, but not until later in my opinion. Once you have the basics handled, just get some scissors and tear up all of the clothes on all of the zombies. Then, you can grind the skill by patching clothes and making Omega safe gear. But, just don't get grabbed and you can walk around naked. Fishing is very good for catching fish. Remember all those spears we made? Now you can use them to fish. Stand. Fish. You're set. You can use a rod, but why not stab your food like a true Neanderthal? Trapping is also worth grinding later in the game. Set up a bunch of traps and check in the morning. Consistent meat. Foraging, once again, does not provide much use until later in the game. However, you can find branches to make spears and other useful items to craft with. Additionally, after reading the Herbalist magazine, you can find plants for health. But, like I said before, just don't get hurt and you won't need to eat a plant. To address zombification, you get bit, you die. You get lacerated, you might die. You get scratched, you'll probably be okay. If you feel nauseous and anxious after being touched by a zombie, it's over. Drink some bleach or feed yourself to the hordes. Don't waste your time fighting it. Don't lock yourself in a closet like some of those other nerds. You're fine, and you don't need to hide in there. It's okay. In regards to the lore of this game, I know some people care about this kind of thing, like those who care about who Soldier 76 first kissed and if Celeste married Leo. However, I don't. It's not that I don't appreciate the efforts put into the news and the TV shows before the signal goes out. If you care, go to the wiki. It's very comprehensively covered. Now, I'd like to offer some constructive feedback. The game is imbalanced. Some skills take no time to level like carpentry, but after I disassembled thousands of watches and lamps, I learned nothing. Same with mechanics. The time investment needed to level is just absurd to the point that it's not even worth it. I'll simply find another car, hotwire it, and I'm set. Additionally, the levels relating to your agility seem to be imbalanced. There are tales of those still leveling nimble, which is arguably the most useful and needed skill, allowing you to move faster while in the ready position to strike, to the point that you don't need to run from zombies to get distance. Fitness and strength also take absurdly long times to level even at the beginning to the point that realistically you should be choosing perks to start at a higher level. Also, why do none of the cars have gas in them? It's easier to find VTubers on Twitch with giant titties than it is to find a car with gas in the tank. It doesn't make any sense to me. This is supposed to be taking right at the start of the apocalypse. You're telling me that all of these cars have already been siphoned? Sure, but why would a car parked in someone's driveway be siphoned of their gas 
while a fresh pot of soup is cooking on the stove. It's just a small, silly thing. Now it is time to address the multi-hit controversy. Apparently, unknown to me, if you want to be taken seriously in the Zomboid community, you cannot play with multi-hit. Multi-hit allows you to push, smack, and stab multiple zombies at once. Without it, each action only affects one zombie, so you can only push one zombie, hit one zombie, or stab one zombie. This makes taking out hordes much more dangerous and much, much more scary. Now, I can understand the stabbing argument, but other than that, I think that the community is wrong. I understand that most people who play this game aren't a 6 foot 2, 270 pound giga chad gorilla man like myself, but come on, you're telling me that you couldn't push back more than one shambling corpse? You're telling me that you can't swing a bat at four zombies and take their heads off in one clean swipe? You're telling me that you're that weak? All right. Fine, I will concede that hitting more than one zombie with a weapon doesn't make much sense. But pushing? Come on. You little weaklings, even the skinniest among us could push two bodies away. End of the day, I'm gonna play how the god gamers say to play, but limiting myself to the weakest among us is truly a difficult choice. I play without multi-hit to prove my power. This game is wonderful. It's a bold and ambitious project that I find myself impressed with every time that I play. It's constantly being worked on and improved, so most problems with it will be addressed eventually. But, even in its current state, it's worth hundreds and hundreds of hours of playtime. The dev team clearly cares about putting out a competent and polished project. They have been working on it since 2013, and it's nearing its decade anniversary. I, for one, am very excited for the addition of NPCs, which up until this point have been limited to voices on a radio or sadistically chasing me in a hidden helicopter. I don't know what this was. I just, I, I just imagined it. I imagineered this. I conjured it. So I should probably end. Man, I look fucking tired. Uh, this was fun. Here's a rating. I would say that this game is your expectation of Back for Blood out of Left for Dead Two combined with Paper Mario. It's a pretty fun game. You should buy it. It goes on sale all the time. Thanks for watching my video. I crump... I punch, crumple, punch, crumple. As I'm crumpling 10-year-olds in front of me, I am an adult man. It, and it makes me uncomfortable. Um... Oh, no! But, like... You know, there's that, there's some magic apply. Oh my God, I'm so dead. There's no way. Hiya, it's your big titty bitch here. PPP. I love you, space.